Electricity has been around for a while, and even though things have gotten smaller and smaller over the decades, we've been designing our devices in pretty much the same way. Scientists have recently made a breakthrough, one which could totally change how we approach electric circuits. So stay tuned to hear all about how one-way conductors could dramatically reduce the amount of energy used by computers. First up, the wonders of superconductors. If you've taken a science class at any point, you're probably familiar with the concept of electric resistance. It gets gets in the way of current flow in everything from wires to capacitors to transistors. Because of how ever-present it is, electrical engineers have pretty much gotten used to having to deal with the reality of resistance, and the heat that's generated due to resistance in devices. On the cutting edge of research, scientists have developed superconductors. You see, at the atomic level, resistance is caused by the vibrations of molecules inside the wires and conductors that are normally used. These molecules get in the way of the flow of electric current. But the thing is, the lower the temperature, the slower those vibrations. If you could theoretically drop the temperature of a material as close as possible to absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius, you could achieve an electrical resistance of almost zero. And that's what superconductors are. Superconductors sure sound like future magic, but they're actually in use in all kinds of applications. From MRIs to bullet trains to quantum computers, the future is, to an extent, already here. But they're not perfect. And some of their drawbacks keep them from being used in even more places. One of the other issues that electrical engineers have to deal with is the dynamic between direct and alternating current, or AC and DC. At the power plant, electricity is produced and then sent along transmission lines in AC form, because that's the best way to do it. The problem, though, is that most electric circuits work best with DC, and they don't appreciate the voltage fluctuations that come with AC. In our typical electronics, this isn't really much of a problem anymore because you can use diodes and similar devices to limit those fluctuations and convert incoming AC into DC. However, putting a diode inside a superconductor isn't really a thing you can do. Until now. Next, a super diode for superconductors. A research team at the Delft University in the Netherlands has actually been trying to crack the case of rectification, which is what diodes do. After years of studying the matter, they stumbled upon the trick to rectification basically by accident, and in a way that they can't quite explain. The magic material is MB3-BR8, whose name really rolls off the tongue. It's composed of atoms of niobium, a metal that's used in certain steel alloys, and bromine, a halogen used for fireproofing. The team's experiments began with them conducting electricity through sheets of MB3-BR8, and they observed that the conductivity of the sheet increased as they used thinner and thinner sheets. Their next move was to make a sort of quantum well out of the MB3-BR8. They stuck a sheet of metal between a sandwich of two other superconductors, and that's how they discovered that they had made a rectified superconductor. What's the science behind the discovery? The lead of the team, Mazar Ali, says he doesn't know. In fact, this actually violates our usual theories of how superconductors work, but he and his team won't rest until they've poked and prodded every aspect of this MB3-BR8, and we hope that they also come up with a good name for it too. So what does this mean for future tech? Right now, superconductor circuits are rectified using electromagnets. Making a setup with superconductors is complex enough, and adding the electromagnets means building additional infrastructure around everything. That seriously limits the versatility of superconductors, to the point where few organizations can use them besides research institutes with hundreds of millions of dollars in grants. But if designers can take advantage of this new metal, the role of electromagnets can be reduced and eliminated, allowing for easier development of superconductor systems. Where might we use superconductors? One idea that immediately comes to mind is using them in quantum computers. They're one of the major applications of superconductors today, and they happen to be very sensitive to heat. Simplifying the build of a quantum computer using this new metal can reduce the sources of heat, which would make them easier to cool. We might actually see quantum computers used in places beyond labs. Perhaps quantum computers could eventually power web services like Amazon and Microsoft. Speaking of web services, could we start putting superconductors in regular computers too? Not in your desktop or laptop probably, but we could imagine a new era of servers and supercomputers built using this technology. Using them in servers would be especially great given how more and more services are moving to the cloud. Data centers today consume a whole lot of energy, 1% of the global total, and it's less because of the servers themselves and more because of the air conditioning needed to keep the servers at arctic cool temperatures. Superconductors are less power hungry and generate less heat, which could cut down on air conditioning costs. There are questions 
questions that need to be answered before we can get there, though. We haven't really figured out the limits of MB3BR8 or whether there are any other conductors with the same properties. And absolute zero temperatures aren't exactly realistic even for a billion dollar corporation. Some experts suggest that if we could find a way to make superconductors work at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, that would go a long way towards making superconductor setups more feasible. The future is closer now than it was before, but it's still a little far away. Next, in other news, Google's Cryo CMOS. We have to say, Cryo CMOS sounds like the name of a sci-fi movie, but it's a real thing that was invented by Google's quantum computing arm in 2019 and is still under active development right now. One of the inefficiencies that plague quantum computers right now is that they have a lot of non-quantum parts. Among those parts is the controller that's responsible for manipulating the qubit inside the dilution refrigerator. These controllers are currently made using traditional electronics, which means they have to be outside and far away from the fridge. In 2019, Google detailed their concept for a cryo CMOS controller that could sit inside the fridge with the qubit and do its job there. The controller would only increase the temperature inside the fridge by about 4 kelvins, which wouldn't bother the qubit too much. Being able to stick this controller inside the fridge would do a lot to reduce the overall size of the quantum computers, which currently fills up rooms and then some. That's really good news for anyone trying to solve the impossible problem of improving quantum computer logistics. And now, Borealis lights up the quantum computing world. Two key terms in the quantum computing world are quantum advantage and quantum supremacy. While we're making strides in the development of quantum computers, traditional computers are getting better and better too. And all the investment in quantum computers only makes sense if quantum is better than traditional. There have been a few computers in the past to achieve quantum supremacy, which they managed by performing tasks that would take traditional computers ages to do. And just a few days ago, a new one made the list. The computer is called Borealis, and it was built by Jonathan Lavoie and his team at Xanadu Quantum Technologies in Toronto, Canada. Borealis uses the proven tech of photonic qubits. Photonic computers were the ones to previously achieve quantum supremacy too. Xanadu put Borealis through the standard test of quantum supremacy, a boson sampling problem. The challenge would have taken a regular computer 9,000 years to complete. Borealis pulled it off in 36 microseconds. So clearly, Borealis smashed traditional computing. But how does it compare to other quantum computers? The design of Borealis is based on Zhou Zhang, the last computer to achieve quantum supremacy, but they were able to simplify the design quite a bit. That makes Borealis more efficient and gives it a higher ceiling of computing ability. Lavoie and the team at Xanadu can enjoy their time at the top, but quantum computing is moving faster than ever, and we suspect Borealis will be dethroned before long. Finally, we have India's $1 billion investment. The quantum computing race is heating up, with many of the world's heavyweights trying to produce the best quantum computers in the world. India is planning to invest a whopping $1 billion in quantum technologies over the next five years. More specifically, they'll be diving into quantum information, meteorology, and communications. Also on the agenda is a 50-qubit quantum computer, which will supposedly be ready by 2026. If they can pull this off, they'll be getting in on the ground floor of a very competitive industry, and they could leverage their position to become a new technological superpower. What makes India's entry into the quantum world different is the investment of the government. Elsewhere in the world, quantum research is being done by major tech companies and multi-million dollar labs. Here we see the Indian government injecting a lot of cash into developing a local industry of quantum-focused companies. The senior director of Avasant, a management consultancy working with the government, expects the number of startups focusing on quantum technologies to grow from 14 to 15 today to over 400 in the next 10 years. India is really poised to become a dominating force in the quantum world, and we love to see it. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.